if you think about that, it's hard to find an apartment in New York that's $2,000. But in order to, to, to be eligible for that, you have to make 80 grand. So you live in Connecticut now? No, I live in Brooklyn. You live in Brooklyn, okay. I live in Brooklyn. Um, <clears throat> I'm in Clinton Hill neighborhood, so I'm right right in the middle of, uh, of all the action. During COVID, we considered moving to Jersey, where my in-laws live. Um, but a few other people had the same idea. Yes. Yes, they did. <laughs> so it was impossible. <clears throat> it was impossible to find anything. I mean, we went, we basically went all the way down the spectrum, all the way to like, let's just buy a tear down. Let's just buy land mm -hmm. and just do it. Um, but a lot of people had that idea too. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just tough. So we decided to stay put. We're glad that we did. Um, things have normalized. And I think Brooklyn, in hindsight, um, and this should be no surprise, but Brooklyn did did really well, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, a lot of the Brooklyn neighborhoods, uh, they were thriving right through COVID, right? Mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. because you have more outdoor space, more walkable neighborhoods. Um, and so I think that's, Brooklyn has benefited as a result of that because more people realize that, um, you know, through COVID, how, how strongly it did. Which neighbor, not hood, but which, uh, which borough you think fared the worst? Oh, fared the worst? Yeah. Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah, Manhattan for the worst. Even more um, than the Bronx, even, yeah. Well because they're the, really the Bronx really never well, went up or down, right? During during COVID, the people of the <clears throat> outer boroughs had it the worst because the pe the working class people in the outer boroughs were the ones who still had to go to work, right? Like they couldn't they didn't have jobs that could be done remotely. Mm -hmm. Um they didn't have financial resources to move, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To up and move. Um, and so I think the people in the outer boroughs in general had it the worst, which probably means the Bronx and, and Brooklyn, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> where, where you have most, uh, you know, a higher concentration of, of blue collar. Um, Manhattan business was hit the worst, right? So mm -hmm. um, during that time, it was quite surprising to see how many uh, retail and commercial businesses basically had to shut their doors because there was such an exodus, mm -hmm. right? Um, <clears throat> and how sustained that was. Uh, whereas in Brooklyn, a lot of the restaurants were able to maintain, right? Mm -hmm. They were just mm -hmm. met many fewer of those stories. So you saw things in Brooklyn like um, open streets, right? Um, which started out kind of improvised, mm -hmm. right? Where these business improvement districts um, and the neighborhood associations just basically said, we're gonna shut the street down and we're gonna create a way that restaurants can still serve customers outside mm -hmm. so that they don't all fold. Right. Um, and the city got on board with that. And, mm -hmm. you know, they were able to kind of formalize that. So to this day, in my part of Brooklyn, uh, on Vanderbilt Avenue, um, it's now a huge attraction. So people mm -hmm. come down from the city um, and even from the suburbs, they actually come down to that to Vanderbilt Avenue. Mm -hmm. It's basically like a block party almost. Yeah. Yeah. Every every weekend. Right. During the summertime. Yeah. Um, so they shut it down Friday and they open it back up on Sunday. And basically you can. Kids can ride their bikes, you know, um, you can sit down and eat, you can drink, you can party, basically. Um, so some of that thriving, I think, is, mm -hmm. you know, those are some of the um, the silver linings that came out of. Yeah, out people of interacting with each other again. People, yep, absolutely. One of the things that I thought was uh, interesting that I never really put my hand on is, of course, you know, the cities are businesses of their own, right? And mm -hmm. they get a certain amount of revenue from those parking tickets, they alternate do. side parking tickets, yeah. right? Yeah. And because they had all those sidewalk cafes, mm -hmm. streetwide cafes, they were losing all that money, all that yeah. tax revenue. Yep. And I don't know. I mean, last time I went up there, uh, what is the name of like the quality, right? Quality meats, quality Italian, quality mm -hmm. whatever. Yep. They still had the the sidewalk kind of cafe. And, and I just, every time I see that now, all I can think of is, how much money the city's losing in in their ticket, right. their alternate side ticket revenue. Right. Yeah. Um, but hopefully, somewhat having that offset, um, you know, keeping by, businesses by, open by, by keeping. Businesses I mean, that's open, the most important right. thing. The government um, is supposed to do what it takes to keep the the the, the population absolutely, running. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you don't want people to go out of business and then have more people upset. Absolutely. Right. But, um, and also, if you can, if you can bring people into New York, especially from the suburbs. Um, and you have a more of a, a more pedestrian culture, mm -hmm. I'd have to believe that that actually is a net positive economically for the city mm -hmm. because a person who leaves their car, right, at whatever entry point and, decide, and commits to coming to downtown or coming to Brooklyn or going to Dumbo or wherever they're going spends more time and spends more dollars, right, mm -hmm. arguably, mm -hmm. um, 
kind of patronizing more of the more of the businesses and doing more, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I hope that that um, that offsets things. But um, as a developer, I can tell you that there are definitely other areas that the city uh, did not let up at all on on generating revenue. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a lot of other kinds of tickets that the city can write. Um, you know, violations for for right. um, property owners and for developers, and you know, the city has uh, they have a lot of different revenue streams. Oh, I want to get to there. Are you ready? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've been rolling on all this. Great. So, hey, welcome to uh, another episode of Money in the Bank with Frank. Today we have a special guest. We have Omar Slow. He's the founder and president of Harpia Asset Management. He is a uh, real estate developer in uh, New York City. And we've been talking a little bit about he, uh, real estate and New York City as a whole. And uh, he's in town for a conference. There was the McGuire Woods, McGuire Emerging Woods. Manager Conference yeah, here in Dallas. Which, it's the second person from uh, from New York came down last year. There was one. Now we've mm-hmm. got two. Sorry he couldn't make it, but <clears throat> hopefully next time you guys come down, we can do a bigger roundtable and 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 talk a little bit more about. As I said before, you know, people just assume that when you work in finance, that you work in finance, that everyone knows what everyone else is doing, and right. that is so far from the truth. Right? right? Absolutely. So, uh, as a real estate developer in New York City, tell me about the permitting issues like i know that california is having issues they've got these Mm -hmm. class a buildings that maybe no one's ever going to go back to work in the hardest part they say is converting those buildings from commercial to residential like to me it seems like a layup it's like okay you've got the skin on the building you've got the building you just have to demo some walls and build build uh housing but i guess it's not that easy right it's not that simple so um there, there i think the two biggest limitations are uh, one is the um, is the policy limitation, right? The bureaucracy and um, you know working through all of that. But there are also physical limitations, right? Practical physical limitations of design. If you have a commercial building that's really large, right? Um, one of the main things that residential needs mm-hmm. is light and air, right? Um, to living spaces. And so if you have a really large floor plate, mm. it can become not very economically feasible, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. To have a large portion of that floor space not really um, easily usable for living, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, to make the economics work, right? So um, there are some solutions to that. There are some commercial buildings that that works fine for, especially if you have like basically a, a curtain wall kind of um, facade structure, right? Mm-hmm. Where you have ways to get light in, uh, where, or where you have um, kind of centralized shafts where you can use light tubes and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. That's more kind of on the sustainability sustainability spectrum. Mm-hmm. But um, but in general, yeah, there definitely can be uh, limitations to that um, to converting. And then there's just capital, right? It takes yeah. quite quite a, it's a big undertaking um and 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 a risk in uh, executing a business model like that not knowing whether it's going to work. And are there specific we'll say either consumer or institutions that would fund that? Would that be something that you, know, you hear a lot about the residential or the, sorry, you hear a lot about the re- the regional banks who tend to do more of that type of financing. Is that still the case? And if so, what are the mm, issues? So, yes, uh, I think that um, a lot of real estate development, and I, I can only speak from a New York perspective, um, is primarily funded by uh, local regional um, banks, mm-hmm. and um, and so for for a lot of those, right, they've they've had their liquidity challenges with capital flight. We're starting to see signs that a lot of them, uh, right, even today, headlines where a lot of them are starting to see return of that capital. So that's great. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the banks that I deal with, and I'm not going to drop names, but um, have actually done well beca- precisely because their deposit base um, is in mom and pop businesses that do a lot of, you know, basic, you know, um, defensive community, uh, you know, business, mm-hmm. and so those deposits are sticky, right? Yeah. Um, and and uh, and because it's a true community bank mm-hmm. where that community, right, rallied around the bank and didn't. You know, didn't uh, they didn't experience a lot of capital flight? Um, so those banks are still there. They're mm-hmm. still lending. They're probably navigating a more difficult environment. You know, now that the headline uh, noise is dying down, they're still probably um, dealing with um, you know the the rate environment. Right? Recycle. Let's talk about AI. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there you go. Um, and uh, and you know, kind of net. Uh, you know, their 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 net margins um, being squeezed. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's something that the, the overall market is going to have to work through. Um, there's there is there is a big need for um for in in new york for city hall to get behind um 
kind of more more accelerated, um, kind of addressing on a more accelerated schedule, um, making it easier mm-hmm. for and, and providing funding and support, mm-hmm. um, tax or, or whatever else um, for developers to do that, right? Mm-hmm. To convert some of these commercial spaces, to convert some of these hotels. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, one that of, seems like a layup, all those... There somewhat just, rundown hotels that are nice so areas much like over development of hotels you, yeah. years ago right. and i think i think anyone paying attention knew that it had to end in tears it didn't make any sense yeah um you know the the uh it, there was just relentless development of hotels in all of these neighborhoods um it's one of those things where for whatever whatever weird reason um the the particular economics of doing that mm-hmm. made a lot of sense and so um, whenever you kind of create an incentive structure, right, that makes sense, people are just going to do that and wash, rinse, repeat, right, mm-hmm. as much as mm-hmm. possible. Um, I think the good news is that hotels probably work better, right, mm-hmm. for um, especially kind of smaller form factor apartments, right, um, which is something that we need, right? You know, mm-hmm. studios, one beds um, is something that we need. Um, so hopefully uh, I, I think New York City finds mm-hmm. a way to come up with programs that kind of get developers back on the horse, so to speak, um, doing more of that work. Uh, and and I'll I'll just make a small plug for smaller developers. Yeah. Because I think a lot of the I think a lot of the policy consideration is focused around very large development. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things I always say uh, whenever I have a chance to say it, like now, is that New York City, um, mm-hmm. as big of a city as it is. It's a city of small buildings, mm-hmm. right? We look at the skyline. We let, you know we were all looking up and focusing on these on these glass towers and these steel towers, um, but New York City is a city of small buildings, especially residentially, yeah, right. Um, and so, uh, not only the residents, but also the entrepreneurs, the families that sure. own these small buildings, mm-hmm. right? Um, don't they? They don't typically get as much uh, policy support. Um, in in developing that. And that's something that New York needs very much because we have old building stock, mm-hmm. right? Um, we have mm-hmm. some of the oldest building stock in the country and uh, and we're living on top of each other, right? So um, it's expensive and complicated um, to, to redevelop, um, but that's something that we need badly to do um, mm-hmm. if we want to really accelerate urbanization, which I think is something that over long-term is something we should be promoting, right? Because mm-hmm. it's just a more efficient way to live and mm-hmm. a better way to take care of the planet mm-hmm. is to support urbanization, but we have to do it in a healthier way. So we have to incentivize developers to build sustainable buildings that are healthier to live in, like in mm-hmm. terms of air quality, in terms of energy efficiency, um, in terms of just a more robust building, in terms of green roofs, mm-hmm. for example, right? So I think we need to see more more uh, policy from the city that supports that financially and makes it easier for developers to do. Yeah, I think that would be a step in the right direction. One of my clients who um, recently retired from a large company that everyone would have heard of, and he was a risk manager uh, for that institution. and. His swan song, if you will, from that position was writing a paper that was in a pretty big deal economic uh, book. And it he talked about uh, it's the responsibility of a lot of the, the banks and the insurance companies and the capital allocators to not just invest in something that's going to make money, but to invest in something that's going to be um, sustainable, like you said. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm very interested in the way that you've done it. You, I remember when we met years and years mm-hmm. and years ago, you were just kind of getting your feet wet yep. out of banking and into yep. a new development, which you, you bought. And now you told mm-hmm. me you finished yep. and it was, tell us about that project and please expound on the, uh, the sustainability. Cause yep. the one thing that I can say is mm-hmm. that when I was watching, uh, CNBC and Bloomberg in the morning during COVID, mm-hmm. uh, I you could see you you knew that they were at their house because I lived right. in New York Absolutely. City and I knew what that apartment was Absolutely. like. And, you know, I saw that. Okay, that is the front door. I yep. see it's not a hotel room, but it's still yep. got the little. Or a lot of folks just yeah. straight up shooting in their kitchens, right? Yeah, and didn't care, right? And, Which is and, great. And, and the the best part about that is like when people used to come visit me in New York from from Dallas, where I grew up, they'd see my apartment and they'd be like, "Wow, this is it. It's so small." And I'm like, "No, dude, this is." This is a nice apartment. I've got a yep. washer dryer. I've got a right. dishwasher. Right. I've got two bedrooms. I'm yep. the only person living here. That's yep. a big deal. Yep. You know? yep. And they never, they didn't get it. Yep. And I living here now, I get why they didn't right. get it, but it's pay to play up there. It's like right. you don't spend a lot of time in your yep. apartment unless there's right. someone locking you in. Right, right. But you've done something different. <clears throat> so I, I want to start by saying that I don't view um, investing for profit and investing for sustainability's sake as mutually exclusive, because they're not. Um, they, they go hand in hand. And real estate development in general 
is um, is not is not should never be a short term investment strategy, right? Um, it's a building, right? It has a fifty hundred plus year life. So even though even if your expected hold period, right, or your investment plan um, isn't for that whole time, which it usually isn't. The building should be built for that. Yeah, hold right. Your return, sure. um, buildings are not disposable, right? right? So, so you should you should invest in and build the building as though you expect it to last as long as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to sustainability, I think that's that's even like you said, even more important in a place like New York, where all you have is your six or eight or twelve hundred square feet, and so if you're spending a lot of time in it. It needs to be healthy, right? Like the air needs to be fresh. It needs to be healthy, and you need to know what's in the walls, right? And uh, and, and so on and so forth. So um, I think healthier buildings are something that um, the financial return from that is very difficult to glean, right? But but we do know that there are long term negative health care uh, n- negative health effects of um, spending more time indoors, especially if you're living and working in the same place. And having poor indoor air quality, for example, mm-hmm. right? We, we know what those effects are. Mm-hmm. It's just that um, it's difficult to draw as as direct a line to it, and so mm-hmm. we don't really invest in it. What I started doing was, um, and so to talk about my my transition, you know, my background was in finance. You know, I was a high yield and distressed bond analyst, um, and I got into the business almost accidentally, just trying to help uh, the mother of a friend not lose her brownstone. And uh, I had been passionate about sustainable design um, through some entrepreneurial experiences that I had on the side in between jobs years years earlier. And so um, I, I initially approached the business um, by saying, hey, you know, I can put together pretty complicated deal structures. I'm a distressed investor. This is somebody that I care about. And maybe I can I can use that skill set uh, and that expertise to put together a, what what needs to be a more considered, uh, deal structure to help this woman. So you were um, using a sledgehammer absolutely. where they could have used a tack. Absolutely. You know, tack absolutely. <laughs> because, 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 the, and the thing is, um, no one else is going to do that. No mm-hmm. one with my background right. and my, my education and my training is going to spend their time doing that on a brownstone. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, or they may do that on a first deal, but the next deal, the, you know, the next right. stop needs to be a hundred unit building. Right. We hear that story all the time and it's yeah, great. You it's know? the same. And I say this all the time. It's this, it's this, on the retail side. If I'm working with somebody that has $10,000 or somebody that's $2 million, it's still the same work. It's just less. Right. Absolutely. Zeros. Absolutely. Right. So, so th- there's wisdom in that, right? Yeah, there's sure. wis- there's yeah. wisdom in that in making sure that your business can be, um, you know, financially sustainable, right? You should, you should be focused on bigger deals, but the opportunity, this is the opportunity that, that I spotted and, and kind of where my business is focused mm-hmm. was that, um, I was able to, uh, completely gut renovate that building, um, turn it into, um, something that's not opulent, right? There are no, there's no like imported marble or, you know, with, you know, hard to pronounce European names on any, any of the products. Um, but it is high quality. It's a high quality product. Um, it's a, uh, it's a smartly designed building, not just smart design and not just kind of like smart home features, but also smartly designed. Um, and it's the kind of home that someone can live in forever, mm-hmm. right? If they want to rent, like we we have a rent renting culture in New York mm-hmm. and I think that's fine, right? Mm-hmm. It's something that should be celebrated and should be allowed. Um, and, uh, and so a renter can live in an apartment that I build forever. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, they, they I mean, they may, may run out of space, but, um, you know, we generally are designing larger units mm-hmm. that are fully appointed, right. With a full size washer and dryer, um, and every amenity that you need, um, in the home, full size, right. Full size, right. <laughs> that, which is huge, right. Like how do you, how do you wash and dry your comforters, right. And your pillows, right. Um, you shouldn't have to, you know, go walk two blocks down to the, the to the laundromat, right. Um, we're all That's adults, right. Like we're adults here, right. So, um, so all, all the things that and one of the things I say is that all the things we, we have such a love hate relationship mm-hmm. with living in New York, don't we? <laughs> yes, right. And yes. so part of my mission is, is to disrupt that. Right. Like yeah. take the hate out of that equation. That's right. Because you should be able to actually, especially what we're paying to live in New York. Mm-hmm. You should you should be able to love every aspect of living in New York. Right. And going to the yeah. suburbs should be should be a choice or a preference. It shouldn't be a necessity. Right. Yeah. As, as, as you get older and grow. So, um. I want to answer the, the the rest of that question, which is, um, how did I make the transition? So, uh, what we do now, the Harp, what Harpia does now is we identify um, we identify distressed properties mm-hmm. in peripheral New York in the outer boroughs 
we identify owners that have a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's an individual owner or or a church or a nonprofit, whatever it is, that has some kind of distress to it, something that has hair on it. Off market deals um, where there's you know bankruptcy, foreclosure, litigation, um, mm -hmm. violations, what whatever the problem is, um, something that can't simply um, be sold by a broker, mm -hmm. right? That that needs mm -hmm. a workout. And what we do is we leverage, we use our expertise. To, um, to, to do some of the uh, roll up our sleeves and do some of the work up front mm -hmm. to put together a more structured deal to give that owner a dignified exit. Mm -hmm. So that may mean either giving them a more fair price, right? Um, nobody, most capitalists are not mm -hmm. going to offer a homeowner in distress right. a, do a dollar more than they think they can get it for at the auction. Ugly houses, I'll right? buy them, right? Yeah. So I'll come in and I'll, I'll pay them more. Mm -hmm. um, I will give them a you know, much more considered uh, deal structure that makes their life easy and allows them to transition out. I'll take care of um, any occupants, you know, whether it be family members or tenants or what have you. And I make the whole deal, I just make it easy for them to say yes, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of that is built on trust mm -hmm. um, and, and goodwill. Um, the next part of what I do is I do a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout my business. I know everyone is throwing the, that word around and so you know, I mm -hmm. hesitate to even use it, but what it means to us is through every aspect of my business, both on the investment management side and mm -hmm. also on the development side, we actually really work hard to to identify women and minority owned uh, businesses, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, as vendors, so that's whether it's the lawyers, the accountants, um, and, and and other uh, you know other professional service providers, whether it's the contractor. So my contractor on my first project was a woman, mm -hmm. um, a Chinese woman who. Um, Chinese American woman who uh, who's a structural engineer. She's excellent. She's brilliant, um, but probably gets overlooked on on a lot of jobs. Right? Yeah. Um, she's a very small woman. Um, everyone is terrified Wait, of her. She's gonna swing a hammer. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just been a joy working with her. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I think um, if you if you kind of use the same playbook that everyone else uses, you end up with the usual suspects. And then you don't get a chance, right, to look at, at folks that have something different to bring to the table. Right. Um, so we've been pleased with that. Um, we spend about 60% of, of our budgets have gone out to minority and, and women-owned businesses. Which is huge um, compared to the, the national average. I mean, I know Dallas is trying to get to 30%, and I've I don't know if you know this, but I've actually started that journey at the beginning of this year. I was, uh, I started a, well, when I say I started, I actually had a group purchasing organization in the healthcare space and I applied for and received the minority business enterprise designation as well as the disadvantaged business hmm. um, uh, enterprise. And it's getting me nowhere because it's very difficult to navigate that. Yep. You have to know people, you have to meet people, they yep. have to start to trust you. Yep. And then yep. so I, you know, I can't yep. wait to talk off off yep. script about some yep. of this stuff because Look, it's, it's just, really difficult. Getting it's, certified is just getting a ticket to get into the stadium, right? Yeah. That doesn't guarantee you uh, a spot on the court or getting off the bench, so to speak, right? Right. right. So um it's just the requirement that you have to have to even kind of be in the game. Um I I will say uh, I will tip my hat to the folks, at least in New York City. That um, there and through uh, through several uh, kind of mayoral administrations, there really has been amazing work being done by the folks in those seats to try to help uh, drive business towards minority and women owned businesses. I really want to tip my hat to them. Even making the process itself easy, the process for me to get certified was amazing. Um, yeah. And and I'd heard so many horror stories about how long it takes and the bureaucratic process and all the reasons that you can be dinged and kind of not not allowed through. So I really I, I should um, you know just want to kind of shout them out on that. I want to, yeah, you know, to that degree, I also feel that that is uh, in your, with your history of investment banking and knowing to make sure every I is dotted, every T is crossed, that it's probably going to be a lot easier for you to fill out the paperwork to get that done. For me, I was surprised at how fast and how easy it yep. was for me to get it done. But then again, how many account applications and paperwork have I done in my career, right? right? right. A lot. Right. But I can see how some of those questions could have tripped people up and also Absolutely. not having the proper paperwork, not having your own personal data room, right? right. Like right. where's right. my where are my articles of incorporation? Have the paperwork right. actually been filled out. Yep. That was one of the things that I've talked about on here a lot. Is Absolutely. like just having that book doesn't mean anything unless Absolutely. you actually write in it. Absolutely. Right? Yep. So so that is um fundamentally very difficult to be a small business owner. By itself. And then you mm -hmm. add in all of the intricacies that you're doing yep. with getting inclusion, getting a uh, smart and healthy work area mm -hmm. to live, getting the tenants, keeping track of the funds coming in. Do mm -hmm. you have – like how big is the organization or how, how, how do you currently work it? The organization is very small. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I do a little bit of everything, right? Great, yeah. um, and and my partner Jay uh, also works with me on that. We have uh, we have uh, service providers around us that that kind of help. But um, as a developer, you have to run a very very tight ship. You have to run extremely efficiently yeah. because you have to keep that overhead cost down, right? Um, so. One of the things that I do, and for me, the, the inclusion piece uh, and the equity piece is trying to help other small businesses uh, do that, right? So you talked about, you know, knowing what a data room is or even knowing how to, like, keep your, your files organized and, and so on, right? As someone who spent a large portion of my career publishing, you know, 300 pages of Excel and, you know, being reamed out because <laughs> on, on page 47, there's a header that's a 17 and a half font instead of a 17 font. <laughs> I, I know about attention to detail, right? And so, um, you know, lending that that eye to other small businesses, right, who mm-hmm. maybe can't appreciate that, right, um, mm-hmm. is a huge help to them because mm-hmm. they may miss out on bids. Like, forget, like, getting jobs with the city, getting jobs with private developers, mm-hmm. right, sometimes because they miss a piece of paperwork or they don't seem like they quite have their act together mm-hmm. is something that we do. We take a softer approach, right, and we try to take an eye for, uh, have an eye for someone who is um, a great technician, or, or a great craftsman at whatever they do, right? Mm-hmm. But maybe, uh, you know, are, are a little bit weak on the paperwork. Can we get through that, right? Can mm-hmm. Is this something that's going to be a hamstring for us or is it an, an opportunity to help them and help them work with us so that they can be prepared to bid on bigger jobs, right? And mm-hmm. that's the, the piece that's missing. So to me, that's um, having that patience, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and, and being a little bit compassionate sometimes mm-hmm. um, is a big part. Uh, and it's and it's benefited us because mm-hmm. then you, you build a loyalty, right? Sure. Um, and a camaraderie with another small business, right? That then shows us op- they show us opportunities. They become part of your team, right? Absolutely, they become right. part of the team, right? So we 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 do no prospecting for deals at this point, right? It's all reverse inquiry, mm-hmm. and because you know we're because we're so crazy doing the kinds of deals that we do. We now get calls from people that say, I have the craziest deal. Boy, do I have one to and, show you. <laughs> and they're like, like it's it's almost more for entertainment value that people yeah. show us stuff. And they're like, listen, if you can make sense out of this deal and figure out a way to get it done, like, I will buy you dinner. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I don't even want a fee. Um, so, and that's actually how we got the latest deal. The one we're working on now is uh, construction. It's a ground up construction. It's my first ground up building. Um, it's near the Brooklyn Museum. And it came to me because another developer literally said that. He said, listen, I really love this property, but I have no idea how to make heads or tails out of this. There's yeah. just so much craziness going on. Uh, there were there were four different legal actions uh, attached to the property. The politics and, of the situation. Family, and, oh, right. my goodness. Um, and yeah. so to me, you know, everyone kind of runs out of a burning building. I'm the guy that runs in. And so I said, I can figure this out. This looks like a, a fun challenge. Yeah. Um, and so here we are now kind of, you know, we helped, we helped the family move on. Um, you know, wife and kids who were living in the building, we helped transition them peacefully, um, you know, uh, helped to kind of support them landing. Because mm-hmm. in a lot of these cases, a lot of the, the homeowners or, or tenants that are in there um, don't have stellar credit, right? right. Or they, and there may be a good reason for it, right? They're good people. Um, but in New York City, you know that that's the kiss of death, right? Mm-hmm. Like if your credit better be great uh, mm-hmm. or you better have a really great guarantor, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or it's very difficult to rent. And so removing some of those is like part of the mission too, right? Moving so some of the challenges. To- to dig down deeper into that for the people yep. that don't understand the New York uh, real estate market, when I was applying for the mortgage for the place that I had in uh, Greenwich Village, it was obviously a great neighborhood, great area. The apartment itself was fine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wouldn't say that it was like you know real housewife material, but it was it was right. fine. And you had to either make enough to cover a hundred times your monthly rent, yep. so that's Yep. For a thirty seven hundred and fifty dollar a month thing, that's you yeah, know better part, yeah, yep. three hundred seventy five thousand. Yep. yep. And that's just one apartment yeah. in that whole building. Yeah. Right. And, 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 he, and people don't realize they're like, wow, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And that's to live in that place. Yes. Yes. Now, uh, on the on even on the the bottom end of that mm-hmm. range, right? The rule of thumb for <laughs> um, you know the outer boroughs for. A quote unquote affordable, right? People who don't live in New York might laugh at what we think will be called affordable. Yeah, but, right. I know. But, <laughs> but even even for affordable housing and small landlords, the rule of thumb is forty times. So, right? If you think about that, if like it's hard to find an apartment in New York that's two thousand dollars, but in order to 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 be eligible for that, you have to make eighty grand, mm-hmm. right? And so people like you and me may not think that we don't think that hard about it. Mm-hmm. But if you look at what the AMI, right, the the, the area kind of uh, median income is in New York. There's a lot of people that don't make that cut, 
So yeah. how, how are they living, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we have public housing, which you know, isn't great, has its own issues. Um, but that's a real challenge. So mm -hmm. part of what I'm doing, and I don't profess to have the answer to it, um, is, uh, is trying to figure out, as I'm moving forward with my business, I'm focused on small buildings. Building small buildings affordably is very difficult. Mm -hmm. They're impossible, right, um, for smaller buildings. Wait, you over budget? So the, the challenge is, from an underwriting perspective, the cost of land is so high, the mm -hmm. cost of development is so high, and the, the cost of development is so high per square foot for a smaller building, just because you don't get some of the economies of the scale, scale right. in building a larger building. And mm -hmm. some of your soft costs, especially, are going to be really high relative to mm -hmm. the building, because mm -hmm. Department of Buildings doesn't care how small your building is. You still got to go through Code, all, yeah. all the hoops and wh yeah, whatnot. Yeah. Um, and, so, and then if you're smaller, too, and you're more likely to be using private loans, your cost of capital is higher, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. all of those things compound to make it just much more expensive for a smaller building mm -hmm. when you're done with that. Right. And your cost per square foot is, you know, uh, seven, seven hundred to eleven hundred per square foot, as opposed to, you know, five to seven on a much larger building. It becomes very difficult to um, to get financing right at an LTV that makes that viable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, you have a lot of trapped equity. You may have to put in more equity mm -hmm. just to keep the building and, and the return profile, you know, just gets really anemic on, on a building like that. So that's the reason that 421A was important. Right. And the reason that. Um, the city has to have New York City has to have programs like that um, that that kind of uh, you know make make the models work right for for folks to do affordable housing. So um, on that, I've oh God, it was probably the last four or five years uh, living there. I had heard about that affordable housing. There's like NYC Connect, I think, or NYC, mm -hmm. yep. yeah. And yep. and they still send me emails because I mm -hmm. guess they still think right. I live there, which is fine. But right. I keep looking it's at like it. It's like a two year lag. And I think it's just so fascinating, like how nice some of those affordable yeah. housing buildings are. Yeah. But like even me, what in the past five years when I was there mm -hmm. applying for them, yep. and knowing that I qualified for them based on the income I I um, mm -hmm. was making at the time, I was like, "There's no way I'm going to get that." It's almost like a lottery, it, right? It, yeah. It it's um I don't even know the right way to describe it, but the, the I've gone through the process once, and I know lots of other professionals that have at some point in their life, and um, most of them did not make it through. For one reason or another, um, and so it's 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 a gauntlet. It's very difficult to make it into those. And so one of the things that I always say, um, you know, not to knock the idea of affordable housing. I think it's great that we're doing it. Um, we need more of it. Um, but I do think that there needs to be a, a look at how you widen that net, how you really um, fix the the parameters that you're using to filter people mm -hmm. to actually make it applicable to actual New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. So people who are actually from New York, mm -hmm. who have raised their families in New York, who are multi-generational families in New York. That are in that borough, in that neighborhood, aren't have getting been pushed their whole out. life. Yeah, aren't getting, getting pushed out, right? right. Now, now, they do do a good job of prioritizing with the way they prioritize the lotteries um, of getting people who live near near that building um, selected in the lottery. They do do a great job of that. But then getting through the, the actual selection process is very difficult. And in a lot of ways, one of my biggest beefs with 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 the way the policy is set in New York is that we punish success. Um, and so New York is a place where immigrants and working class folks came to to try to make it. Mm -hmm. And so if they do what what we ask them to do, which is work hard, pay your taxes, be a productive member of society, educate your kids, which is what immigrants and poor people do mm -hmm. in New York. Mm -hmm. And then your kids uh, kind of benefit from that because if they have gotten a great education and they've worked hard and now they're middle class, mm -hmm. everything that we're saying and doing to them says, now leave, now go to the suburbs. Yeah. Right. Right. There's, there's no place here for you to live unless right. you're now a millionaire. Right. Mm -hmm. or, or unless you kind of make, you know, you're, you're, you're the camel that gets through the eye of the needle to find your way through one of these lotteries to stay in one of these apartments. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm born and raised in, in Brooklyn. Right. I can count probably on one hand the number of friends that I know who have made it through that lottery. So something about that is not, and really that's somebody working. that's actually in that industry, yeah, and, and see yeah. that space all the time, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think there's more that needs to be done for smaller buildings. Um, with that, I think that, um, I think that the, I think that uh, the agencies um, that are working on this stuff need more resources, right? Mm -hmm. That's a typical problem, right? Like they don't have enough uh, man and woman power in those seats to run the programming for smaller buildings. So they have the same problem where they have to focus on the mm -hmm. bigger buildings, right? right. To, to make their budgets make make the most sense, right? To get the most leverage out of their own budgets. Um, so that that's kind of a, a problem that I think the city needs to address because small buildings really are the lifeblood of New York. Most New Yorkers live in small buildings. Most New Yorkers so, don't live in, in thousand unit buildings. I like to think of kind of big 
big picture kind of thing. And I, I see this problem happen a lot. And I equate it to when you're buying your very first house. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's here in this area. You'll, you'll, you'll buy a starter home. And you don't know it's a starter home. To you, it's like, I'm going to live here forever. Right. Right. And then you buy it and, you know, maybe the kitchen's too small. Maybe you don't like the setup of it. Mm-hmm. Maybe the neighborhood's going down. Maybe any number of maybes. Right. Right. Whatever right. it is, you like to entertain a lot. No one likes to come over. Right. It's not comfortable inside. Right. You've got two choices. You can tear down the house and do it again. Mm-hmm. Or you can move. Right. Into one that's right. more like what you want. Right. And more people move. Right. Right. So, uh I see that in what you're just saying because again they're they're going to keep focusing on the bigger buildings because mm-hmm. the scale's there and mm-hmm. because it's going to it, it um, it'll show a bigger number right and they're going to rely on the small developer to you know make as much as you can while you're doing that and mm-hmm. hopefully do it in such a way that's still going to be beneficial to the city right right so but that's that's the way New York has always been so you know that's hey you've got to have you've got to have some agitation in order to make some money that's true that's true um and and i think they're starting to hear our voices more um i do hope that that they begin to more aggressively address some of this just because i do worry that um look as much as it's beneficial as a developer or as a landlord to um have tenants or or buyers that are able to pay top dollar for product that's great um i do worry about um we were talking before about New York as compared to some other large cities. Mm-hmm. And one of the strengths that I think New York has always had for 400 plus years Tons is, is that we have, we're, it's just a very dynamic uh, uh, society, culture, mm-hmm. right? Uh, economically, every way you look at it, um, you know, diversity of industries and so on and so forth. So at a time yeah. like COVID, you see the benefit of that, right? In that we were able to make it through, mm-hmm. right? And the outer boroughs were able to survive and, 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 and kind of sustain themselves, right? Um, but if you go- A lot to, of survivors, a lot of crazy, but a lot of survivors. Well, a, lot, a lot of, <laughs> look, we, we, we forget that, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. I think, I do think that New York has become a little bit, a little bit soft. You become a little too, too kind of Disneyland. I think if you talk to someone who was around in the 80s and the 90s or the 70s even, right? Uh, they will tell you, right? Like, yeah, I mean, New York has always had its wealthy or whatever. You know, you've always had your your millionaires and you billionaires had your place. riding the subway you had your right bear. next to your, yeah. you know, whatever, right? You know, stepping over, you know, uh, <laughs> you know whatever riffraff. Um, so New York has always existed that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that we've a little bit, uh, as as a group, we've kind of forgotten um, kind of where, where we come from and what the right. city is. Oh, uh, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and there's a compassion in that too, right? Like, in that, um, as a as a kid growing up in the outer boroughs, I was just kind of raised to um, kind of treat everyone the same, and I I would go up and talk to anyone regardless of what kind of socioeconomic class they came from. Yeah. Um, and I felt like that's something that used to be reciprocated. That used to be kind of understood. Yeah. In New York, and I think that um, I worry uh, about one of the things that I liked about moving back to Brooklyn. I'll tell you this, because uh, I lived in Manhattan for a while, mm-hmm. and one of the one of the reasons that I was happy to move back to Brooklyn is that you could live in a building in Manhattan in Midtown for years and have neighbors that you know, you know them, and they know you, and they don't say hi to you. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine that? There's mm-hmm. something odd to me about that. And moving back to Brooklyn, it's like you know, uh, love it or hate it, but everyone's in your business, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone says hi. They talk to your kids, right? It's just more of a, a neighborhoody c- kind of community yeah. feel. And, and so I worry about um, that culture moving into places like Brooklyn and moving into the Bronx. Well, from when I moved, I moved there, I want to say like around 97. And uh, I feel like I hit the sweet spot because it was still pretty rough yep. when I was there. And then as I grew up, it grew up. We had political change. They cleaned it up and yep. it became Disneyland. Yep. But when I first moved there, the average person lived in Manhattan for four years. That's right. why you don't hear you, you still mm-hmm. know a Brooklyn accent. Mm-hmm. You can tell a Bronx yep. accent, yep. you know, you yep. got Queens. Yep. Staten Island, not so much, but mm-hmm. Manhattan, nothing. There's literally right. one person That's I know true. that lives in Manhattan that still has that accent. It's a that Betty Boop accent. Mm-hmm. And and mm-hmm. her name is Tina and she's delightful, <laughs> wonderful woman. But like Hi, Tina. <laughs> the average person like lived there for four years and then they moved back to where they came and they mm-hmm. went back with like thick skin because they were there and they went through right. the trauma right. of New York City. And right. I feel like through the crucible. Yeah, and I feel like this particular uh, – we're, we're reverting to the mean a little bit. It's going to get mm-hmm. a little rougher, and people are going to have to have thicker skin. Maybe they do yeah. stay a little less uh, less time. But, right. uh, you know, it's, it's 
like that place is changing dynamic survived so much and been through so much right so yep. I, I i have faith that it'll survive and it I, will. I just love what you're doing with it though i love that you're able to take that experience you have that as i said you know the average person with your background wouldn't be doing this uh, if they did, they would be doing it, you know, for a uh, CB Richard Ellis or right. something like that. Right. And right. Big not, development company. Yeah. And not really paying attention to the people that live there. So I love hearing that part of the story, but also lucrative. Look, I mean, and that's what I was going to get to is that we're not a charity, right? Um, we, we, we are, we're a fund manager, right? So we, right. we operate an opportunity zone fund. We're about to launch a parallel fund. We, um, we have a development company. Um, I, like I said, I do think that um, building and developing sustainable small buildings um, can be done profitably, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that um, there is a mission to, to what I'm doing, right? And aside from the one, the parts that I mentioned, right? Um, you know, helping folks on, on the acquisition and the diversity, equity, inclusion, and then sustainability that you heard me talk about. Um, I also, I'm also becoming more passionate about small buildings um, and, and becoming more passionate about um, kind of advocating for that. And, you know, I, when I started doing this, I just, I was a typical finance guy, right? Like completely apolitical, <laughs> hated both parties, hated everybody, yeah. right? Um, and I, a typical New Yorker, right? And mm -hmm. so, um, and so I, I think I've matured a little bit um, mm -hmm. with the help of some of my partners who, as they're, if they're listening to this, they probably know who they are, who helped me understand <laughs> that um, it's, it's more of an ecosystem, right? Yep. And it's a symbiotic yep. relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, in order to be really effective and effective, not just for myself and, 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 uh, and making my business successful, but also kind of um, setting the stage for other people like me, right? Because mm -hmm. I think this, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of these people who tries to hide my business model because I, I really hope that a hundred more me's does what I'm doing, right? right like right. in New York even, right? There's, there's, I really do think that there's enough upside. So to me, it's crazy when an investor says to me, um, you know, prove to me that uh, that there's pipeline, prove to me that there's distress. Or, uh, I mean, this, this isn't a question I get today anymore, but up until a couple of years ago, right? Like, can you actually find distress in these neighborhoods? Like, is there, are there distressed properties in Park Slope and Prospect Heights and, and all these neighborhoods? And I say, if you walk down any of these blocks in New York, and Talk to any of these people and hear they're crazy. You'll know that there's distress out there. <laughs> there's distress out there, right? Like, and look, I, and I'm not saying that that's a good thing, right? But it's the reality, right? If there's mm -hmm. 200 uh, brownstones on a block, right, regardless of what the average household income is or regardless of what the average home value is, there's always a building there that's in trouble. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so part of what we do is, uh, and we're not charity, right? Like we don't have time to, to I mean, there, there are programs out there that we point people to if they are an owner occupier that wants to stay in their home and need that help, right? That's not what we do. But if uh, if the wheels are kind of falling off the wagon, right? And it's a bad deal, there usually is not, um, there, there right now are not a lot of actors that I'm, I'm gonna be very polite, that are at best uh, opportunistic, mm -hmm. right? Um, and not in a, I don't say that in a great way. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we're that bid, right? Like we're that person that's going to come in. We're going to be compassionate. We're going to be patient. We're going to be understanding. Uh, we're going to put together kind of a structured deal. It helps us make money. They make money. Mm -hmm. um, and, and everybody's happy. But um, I, I'm long-term greedy, right? As, as the folks, the good folks at Goldman say, in that I do think that if I'm able to, to prove that this model can be, um, can be lucrative, um, I hope that there is more more focus and support on it, and I hope that it it's, it becomes um, an on ramp for a lot of other budding entrepreneurs mm -hmm. to be able to do this because I think our city needs it. That's great. Have y'all? So have you heard about? So over COVID, I heard like multiple stories from uh, people I knew about uh, like commercial establishments getting bought out by uh, foreign uh, actors who came in. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Like when you say commercial, like restaurants, restaurants and stuff like that, um, and basically is sat on and basically forced to close so they could take over. Oh, that kind of stuff happens all the time. Not just restaurants, right? Like so, like um, it depends on what your strategy is, right? If there is an a, a, a if you want a if you want a piece of real estate, um, and there is a business operating in there, or you know, or even tenants in there. Part of your strategy, uh, your development strategy, may be to to basically vacate the property, right? And so I don't I don't mean to put that kind of crudely, but um, for an investor, if that's their business plan, uh, from the perspective of the investor, it's something that you want to do, right? If someone may uh, have a lease, and it's just pure economics, right? Someone may have 
what to them is a very attractive lease, right? Where, where they're paying way below market on something. Um, and uh, the building may have a lot of development rights, right? That, that a buyer may want to make good on. Uh, and so um, you have those kind of opposing economic forces sometimes at play. Um, part of what we do um, in, in kind of our mission-driven focus is um, do no harm, right? So, so don't, you know, don't, don't try to use nefarious means to get that person out of that lease in that case, right? Work with them, buy them out, right? Um, which is kind of where you'll end up. If the person is relatively savvy and, 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 uh, and, and well-resourced, they'll get an attorney, you get an attorney, you negotiate, right? And then you end up with a buyout. Part of my philosophy is rather than hope that the person's stupid or trick them, right? Or uh, use any other kind of various means to stress them out or, or force them out, um, start with the buyout, right? And say, hey, this I want to own this building. This doesn't work. Like your lease doesn't work for me. Can we renegotiate it? No. All right. Well, what's it worth to you? Right. Run, run a DCF. Right. And say it's worth X to me. How about we split the baby? I'll give you this amount. I'll help you move out. I'll give you time to move out. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that most fo in most cases um, with most folks, if you approach them with respect, treat them with dignity and respect and talk to them like they are your aunt or your or your your grandma or something like that. I think most folks take what take kindly to that. Right. And, and they'll be workable. Not always. Right. Sometimes a person says, no, tough. Right. Like, I, you know, yeah, and it, it's my experience that if they've been beaten up enough, if they've already had the come to Jesus moment where they realize that they're really behind the eight ball, it's in the best interest of this property uh, for it to not be as bad. Right. If they're ready to move on. Right. That they're probably going to understand and appreciate that. Yep. Right. Because, uh, you know, life is hard up there. Yeah. And if they aren't ready to move on, then they're not they're not your people anyway. Right. They're not the ones you're going to be able to help. And by the way, that includes tenants. So what <clears throat> I sure. found, yeah, right? And look, yeah. I hope these aren't famous last words, but in, in my experience with tenants, if so, by the way, one of the things from a policy perspective that really needs to be fixed is the is the current policies that are in place are really hurting small landlords. Mm -hmm. especially small landlords that have uh, any kind of rent stabilized tenants. Yeah, cuz it could be years they're getting before. they're getting crushed mm -hmm. because the costs the cost basis has gone up in owning and managing these buildings. The property taxes keep going up. Um they no longer have the ability to deploy capital to improve the building to keep it livable, mm -hmm. right? Because all buildings, right, need you know, need that, right? Right. But, the property values go up, but the tenants who are paying a rent either controlled, which means that it doesn't go up at all, right. or rent stabilized, which, which it only goes up a certain percentage. Historically, it hasn't gone up much, right? I mean, they've, they've made two jumps in, the, in these past couple of years, the rent, uh, the rent guidelines board. But, 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 the rent, but the rent itself that you're coming in, you're taking in as a landlord isn't going up. That's and, not changing. And your taxes will. Will. <laughs> a lot, right? As, so, as of 2019, mm -hmm. you, you right, they basically have taken away pretty much every way for a landlord to make an improvement to a building and then to bake that into a rent increase, right? To get paid. So, um, and it's it was just too crude of a fix, right? Like there's a middle ground. There should be a way to allow a landlord, especially a small one, to make those necessary improvements. So you have these buildings that are falling apart, mm -hmm. right? It's a nightmare for tenants to live in. They hate the landlord, the landlord hates them. And, it, and it's just, it's like mutually assured destruction because the housing stock is only gonna get worse and you're gonna have whatever knock on effects of that, but the landlord's going bankrupt mm -hmm. because they can't get the financing. Financing is is, is cash flow based in those in those properties, right? Yeah. It's not LTV based financing, right? So if the cash flow is staying the same and it's a melting ice cube, how do you refinance? You can't even go you to can't. a bank to say, "Hey, I need a hundred grand to to change the HVAC system or or to change the windows." You can't do that, yeah. right? So to me, what what I what I what I do with that is I approach the tenants uh, open and, and honestly mm -hmm. and say, "Look, this is not a great situation for you to be living here." And let's just fast forward through three years Suspend of hell. Suspend disbelief. And, <laughs> and, let's and here, let, let me help you move to a place that's better. Um, you know, let me pay you, right? And let me make your life as smooth as possible. Mm -hmm. And I find in most cases, um, people, they respond to, first of all, just being treated uh, respectfully, mm -hmm. right? And with dignity is huge, mm -hmm. right? The tenants, the owners, um, that's a huge part of it is just treating people with respect. And some of that requires just a little bit of cultural competency, some of it is my background, um, but I find that that goes a long way. Um, and ultimately, I, I do think that it's something that um, that you'll be able to to quantify uh, the benefits yeah. to how you're able to acquire these properties um, 
and and I'll make I'll make some attorneys uh, not as wealthy um, going going <laughs> going through litigation and you know and all, all the other the legal processes that are involved. But um, I do think that there's there's a need um, for that, and that's been successful for us so far. I I may be naive in this, but you were talking about government uh, incentivization of you know green and sustainable yep. um, projects and. I mean, doesn't that apply to renovating these old buildings? What should do you not believe they should incentivize? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I believe that it's all I, goes I believe together. they need to I think they need to um they need to kind of like expand uh the, the, the lens through which you're looking at that, right? So like um they're at the politicians and, and 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 the overall kind of zeitgeist tends to be focused on the sexy parts, right? So we're focused right now on uh on building electrification, right? So get rid of oil and uh oil and gas, right? Um as energy sources and let's electrify the building, right? Which is great, right? However, if you take out um, a really uh, inefficient but you know high higher capacity steam heating system or or gas powered heating system, and you change it to a mini split, um, which is much more energy efficient but maybe is undersized, but you don't change the windows and you don't change the insulation on the building, right? Then you have less right. You have less uh, heating capacity and a building that's still leaking like a sieve. And so in in New York City, right, then what you end up having is unhappy tenants who are saying, it's great that you guys basically got rid of the carbon monoxide risk, but I'm freezing now in the wintertime or my water doesn't get quite as hot, right? Um, so the, the it needs to be a more holistic approach that I think uh, state, local, and, and the federal government should support in saying, we need to do the whole thing over. You need high performance windows. You need um, better insulation. You need uh, you need uh, w water and, and vapor barriers on on either side of the building. You need to basically make the building envelope high performance. You need higher performance roof. We should be funding green roofs everywhere. New York City put a law in that requires now anytime you're doing a major renovation, 100% of the walkable surface has to be either uh, green roof or or solar. Right. But but where's the money? Like you have to put the money there. Right. The money isn't just in. You can't just like put solar panels on a roof on a brownstone that's 100 years old and that has a questionable structure. You have to get a structural engineer and you have to go in and fortify. Right. The walls of that building so that it can support an extra however many pounds on the roof. Right. And then it's going to be a usable roof instead of a tar roof where people are going to want but should want to go. Right. And, and use that roof. Right. So in order to do that. But then you have to have the additional insurance just in case somebody, you know, takes right. a header. Right. Well, you know, well, you know, you have uh, you have, a, have to have a minimum. Uh, I think it's thirty six or thirty eight inch um, parapet all around, right? So you have to have walls all around. Um, and and if there are children, there there are different systems that you can use to basically make um, you know make the roof kind of child safe. Yeah. Um, but there should be money for that, right? Like if you fly over New York City and you look at the amount of black tar roofs. Right. Um, it's crazy. Right. And yeah. we wonder we wonder why we're getting all these weather extremes. Yeah. Every roof in New York should be a green roof. Mm -hmm. And the government and that also, by the way, helps that in turn helps reduce the strain on our stormwater system. Right. When we have all these storm surges, which we're, we're getting hundred year floods every seven years now, aren't we? Right. Yeah, yeah. So if every roof was a green roof and if we put the money there, especially for these smaller landlords to fortify their buildings so that it's appropriate to put a, a green roof on top. It, it makes the city healthier. It makes the city um, cooler, right? It's just, it, it normalizes the environment a lot more. Um, it's just a healthier place to be. Mm -hmm. And I think those kinds of those kinds of infrastructure investments need to be made by us by a, as a society in order to make urbanization work. Mm -hmm. Just like with every essential investment in our society, everyone's got to kind of be on board to, you know, yeah, vote those things in and pay those taxes they got to pay. Right. You know, even if they right. are on board, the, the difficulty really comes with like nobody wants to cut up their entitlements in order to give you yours. Right. right? And that's the hardest part of the whole right. situation. Right. Is that like we can all agree as New Yorkers or former New Yorkers that mm -hmm. it sure would be nice to be able to be outside more. God knows that there's really only a couple of parks that are right. habitable right. that right. you can get stretch your legs a little bit. Right. But and to be able to have a green space where you'd be able to go upstairs, relax a little bit, get some sun, mm -hmm. you know, everyone loves fantastic. a rooftop, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But where are you going to get the funds to right. allow that to happen? And um, it doesn't sound like the landlords are getting that help right now. So it's going to take, it's going to take money right. from the people that have it that are willing right. to part with some of it in order to make a bigger, longer, mm -hmm. greedier bet, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, 
So I guess it's happy, having its uh, natural progression in general. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. So if people want to find out more about your fund, I know you're you're launching a second fund coming up here. Yep. Uh, how would they get in touch with you? Uh, I will give you my contact info, and I guess you guys can share it. Um, or should I say yeah, now? Yeah, I guess they ahead, can they yeah. can email me at omar at harpiaNYC dot com. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our website uh, is kind of cryptic; doesn't have a lot of information. But if you email me uh, and you're an interested uh, limited partner um, or or co GP, I'm open to uh, kind of anything at this point um, that makes sense to help me grow my business. Great, thanks, Omar. Thanks for coming in. Absolutely, thanks, Frank. Great talking yeah. to you, and Me great too. seeing you as always. Yeah. For sure. Hey, thanks for watching The Merge. We've got a ton more stuff for you to watch on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, everywhere. Check us out.